Hello back. I hope you had a little stretch and are ready for the second part. I welcome, I'm very delighted to welcome Q Ha with us here, or short Q. Hello. Hello. Hey. Uh, Q is originally from South Korea, an award-winning computational designer, researcher, and educator currently based in Pittsburgh, USA. He holds an MFA with honors in digital and media from the Rhode Island uh, School of Design and a BFA in digital media design from Hong Kong University. He's also a recipient from, of the Adobe's Design Education Faculty Award, currently assistant professor at the School of Design at Carnegie Mellon University and also director of uh, CMU Computational Creativity Lab and affiliated faculty in the School of Architecture's Code Lab. Quite a mouthful. <laughs> and you are holding all sorts of other positions. <clears throat> um, Q also completed several fellowships and residency, amongst others, at the Jan van Eyck Academy and Franz Masseril Centrum in the Netherlands and uh, Belgium taken part in various international exhibitions and design festivals and also authored and co-authored various publications, for example, Code as Creative Medium. So you have and had quite a busy life. <laughs> I, uh, I guess the work, um, pleasure, work, uh, balance um, <laughs> is more on the working side or it's, it's this combination, right? Work is pleasure. And uh, well, Q um, has uses code as um, in kind of to build generative systems in, in, in visual environments in, in a context of also typography. And today um, you will share a little bit of your typographic adventures with us. Uh, we've seen already some of your work before. Uh, at the beginning and later on during the break again. So uh, let's uh, play play the video and we'll we'll see you afterwards for some QA. Hi everyone. My name is Q Hashim and I just go by Q. I'm really excited to be here today and talk to you about my work, especially how I create generative typography through computational formation. Okay, so what is computational formation? This is Swiss designer Karl Gerstner's morphological box of the typogram made in the 60s. He parametrized the typographic decisions he would make for setting type. Today, working with various attributes to produce form is very, very natural to all of us. I opened Windows and InDesign and aligned the tools based on their functions. But it is not the computational formation that I want to share today. The design process in InDesign is certainly aided by a computer, but designers would create things within the scope of the tools set by Adobe. On the contrary, this is a project that I contributed last year, Code as Creative Medium. It is the first book published by the MIT Press designed computationally. I used InDesign, but instead of designing individual spreads, I built a set of rules to arrange visual elements, then designed algorithmic systems written in code, more specifically, Basil.js.
Working with rules allow we designers to give ourselves some sort of constraints where we produced a variety of solutions in a consistent manner. Designers conceive and specify situations when forms can be merged. In this regard, the process of making logic is highly conditional. Also, it can be understood as a function that returns a range of output upon the change of input. So both inputs and outputs are considered as variables. Then what do variations or variable forms yield in typography? In my work, I create computational systems to yield variations. As you can see, the letters are treated as an image and rasterized with a certain visual pattern that I devise with code. On a more micro level, it is comprised of modules that transform according to the color values of an input. In this work, a slight change made in the grid module affected the overall pattern. With code, we can construct a whole through the repetition of modular parts. We can see the departure and arrival of the transformation here. The important thing to note is that the contrast between the text and background was maintained. But what if all those circles move randomly and individually? Can we still see the patterns? Uh, the answer is yes. In this work, forms are triggered by pseudo-random numbers every few seconds. It was not about designing a single composition. Rather, it was about designing how variations of compositions emerge. Therefore, I systematically designed the variable patterns, but the details in each variation were somewhat unexpected. Together with unexpectedness, it was my aim to achieve cohesiveness across the variations. So um, there's always um, like slight difference between um, the variations. But they maintain unity because they share the same constraints within which there was this range of freedom. In this case, the outline of letters was constant while randomly cropped image in each particle, rotation, scale, number of repetition were variables. Having random variable is a way to implement a bit of playfulness when generating unpredictable variations. It is like working with freedom in a somewhat controlled manner rather than pure chaos. It is a different kind of dynamism because it is not only playful, but also serendipitous due to unexpectedness.
The variations are created through endless permutation of values in parameters. Even when there are limited number of variations, the form can drive new values anytime. In this way, viewers can experience the perpetual flow and movement. I was able to generate more than thousands of letter forms continuously and seamlessly shifting from one to another state. In this digital installation, the letters were filled with the portfolio images that contributors uploaded online. Like a play, there was transition between three different scenes. Letter forms can be constructed using a sequence of imagery data from online data API. In this work, I intended to express the context of different cities by driving Google Street View images. I could stream data in letter forms, and depending on the data, the work can be driven by a large amount of data, visually rich and dynamic, and even participatory in real time. We've looked at computational formation implemented in my generative typography work. I do want to stress that computation can be a designer's creative medium. All the written code, it is a designer who builds systems to explore, to experiment, to express, to expedite, and to experience the way variable forms are designed and generated. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Kia. Fascinating work. Um, one certainly is, is aware that um, code has become a very important feature in designers' work. And um, you, one can see it already in, in also young people, young designers, they, even in type design, um, they really explore um, and an experiment which is, seems to be really important. So uh, a short question to that. Do you, do you also use Python with this because you had the false and true or what kind of code language do you use? Uh, mostly I use JavaScript in Java. Yeah. So like processing in P5.js or Paper.js um, right. for like visual programming. Okay, cool. Um, and I had another question on, because you talked about rules, right? So you decide on, on rules. How do you go about that? How, how, how is your process on defining these rules? Or how do you decide which rules would be important to you? Mm -hmm. uh, it differs by case, but mostly I start with visual ideas mm -hmm. and uh, kind of like imagine how um, how many and what kind of variations um, uh, that I can create out of my initial like visual ideas. So like thinking about um, the forms over time or upon interaction and also in terms of like a, 
um, like transformation, I spend a lot of time uh, thinking about um, what causes uh, like certain effects or behaviors. So mm -hmm. like kind of like uh, focusing on uh, shaping the relationship between uh, input and output, hmm. but not just for like uh, transactional uh, purposes. It's, it's more, I would say like it's more like uh, emotional and poetic because we are designers and not engineers. Sure. Yeah. No. No. And that's. And I mean, that's that's a kind of a beauty also of of this work. No. I mean, even alone, just looking at these shapes and how they move together, how they interact. That's that really has a very beautiful aspect of it. Um, there is a question from the audience. What's the relation between the program code and the data input? Is it intermingled or separated? How so? Mm. So in most of my work, I write code to build systems. And uh, when I drive data, uh, sometimes um, when I have when I uh, load it from like local files, then it's uh, in my folder. Or if not, uh, when it is online, then I just access the ULL to uh, like retrieve data. And I would say um, the relationship is um, between code and data is, uh, I mean, from my view, uh, code is logic and data is material. Mm -hmm. So, like, okay. instead of, you know, like, my input on, uh, I mean, through my mouse or keyboard, like, I'm kind of, like, a driving data to, like, get a rhythm that can be represented visually in my work. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And what do you think about parametric typefaces? Have you ever experimented with those? Um, typefaces? Yes. Uh, so... I I like the concept of like variable font, and um, and I think uh, I mean to me like it's like a um, font with uh, After Effect like keyframes, and that can be manipulated uh, uh, by a different input or like a different. I mean, it can be like linked to like dynamic context, and I think the most important part of for designer is to figure out um, um, and devise uh, like the noble uh, association between um, uh, what drives uh, the variations. So like, uh, the, again, uh, back to like the relationship and um, because I, I don't design type, I only use it. <laughs> so I'm kind of like focusing on uh, uh, what causes uh, the transformation and how can uh, I create uh, more interesting and compelling experiences uh, through uh, those, I mean, through and within uh, the parametric structure. Yeah, cool. I mean, there has been a few experiments already, like, for example, a sound, no? how does the typeface um, kind of react to sound or light? So, I mean, one can imagine if uh, the technology, the kind of standard technology plays along, um, we would be able to see these not just in, in museums or, or exhibitions, but perhaps in our daily work would be, would be, yeah, would be quite, quite interesting. One last question, I think, yeah. Um, do you believe that AI can be creative in the human sense? Or, is, mm, or what's what's your I what's your take on on AI and creativity? It would it would kind of like depend on how we define uh, creativity mm -hmm. and in what extent. But um, if we um, define creativity as something that uh, uh, yields. Um, unexpected but still like playful and acceptable and preferable like results then uh like definitely it's it's like i mean to me like i i'm kind of like a uh uh 
seeing AI as an intelligent, like pseudo random number, like generator. Like if I, if my goal is to achieve and drive a uh, interesting rhythm out of the uh, machine learning model. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. But right. it can be much more like a responsive and like a um, suited and tailored for one's like a uh, intent and needs because it can be like a, we can, because we can play with a more like personalized results mm-hmm. based on the analysis of data. But uh, it's just, but I, I was, I wanted to say uh, uh, the implementation of AI can be a very like low level, like a uh, not uh, deeply thought out, like risen, like it can be just for like a um, drive for driving um, in- interesting sequence of numbers. Yeah. Right. Yeah, of course. So I don't think we have to be scared of, of AI, at least not at the moment. <laughs> Great, wonderful. Thank you very much. And we'll uh, see you at, uh, at the panel in a little bit. Thank you. Mm-hmm.